Hello and welcome to the skating lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. Hi, you ready for some this and that, Dave? Yes, I am ready. And if you're new here, please subscribe below and ring that bell so you know when we have new content coming out, especially during the off season. You don't know what kind of surprises we have in order. Uh, we actually have been working on coordinating some interviews. There's been something in the works and things like that. You know, when I'm feeling creative. Jonathan, I, <laughs> quickly, I wanted to let you know, I also bought new pillows. You're always showing me new pillows. Yeah, show me your but pillows. But I feel so boring because, you know, my couch is a solid, but I at least try to go against type because I needed to get new okay. pillows. You're but playing with textures, Dave. You're I play with, with textures, textures. and That's colors. Funny. And if you notice, I, I do have a little bit of a design eye element. So, yeah. That's fabulous. Yes. Clean. I, that is kind of the aesthetic I go for with some Liam um, artwork. And then I saw something today. When I move, I'm not bringing this shit. Like, this had its moment. Oh, but and that's fun. Yeah, exactly. It's done, right? Like a new space, new energy. So there's, I have a building I have my eye on. It's not finished being built yet. But anyway. So nice. let's discuss. There's a lot to get into. Actually, we weren't sure if there was going to be that much to get into. But I think... We're going to have some discussion today. I think okay. we, we need to talk about things. We need to catch up. We need to start moving into our new headspace for the new season. And really, I'm feeling cleansed. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and all the skating mothers. I hope that all of the <laughs> skaters really appreciated their mothers so that when they are yelling about how much money they are spending you and driving to the rink, let them feel validated. Let them feel <laughs> engulfed in their love. Mm hmm you do appreciate them. Even when they're beating you in the in the bathroom with a hairbrush, you know they are going... With a parrot on their shoulder. Yes. So... <laughs> okay. All right. So let's walk with this interview with the Terry Two Breeds' former student. Uh, I watched a clip of this girl. She, uh, Paulina Shubodorova. She is now training with Nikolai Morozov. Uh, I, uh, I imagine she's in Hackensack, but... Uh, I was in Hackensack. I did stop by the Gracie and Misha um, we'll get training into, seminar. We'll get okay. into that a little bit. Okay, great. In diplomatic fashion. Um, per the usual. <laughs> I feel nervous about this. <laughs> um, all right. So the interview starts. So this girl, I have to say, she looked like a generic junior of a Terry where I don't look, she's not as talented as Medvita, but. At least what we could see, it looked like she needed more work. The fact that she went to go skate for another country, not shocking when you see her. It looked like she would have struggled to get out of Russia with the competition they have now. So some people are going to say this is sour grapes, perhaps. But it is interesting that it does confirm a lot of things. So people will say that whatever we read is a bad translation, and I'm sure we're going to hear that so many times. But this, this has been translated several times. So what I want to comment on are the things that we have a pretty good idea about and just kind of talk through some of it. Because some things are skating norms, and some are maybe more disturbing or not disturbing. So the first quote is, how did you get into the group of Ateri Tuburitsa? It is very difficult to get there. And she says, I came from Perm to train with Anna Sureva. Now that is the coach, by the way, in that Instagram video, who may or may not have been pulling that guy in the background. Right. Um, in that rink, which is a Terry's rink, uh, the fans were, you know, trying to decipher all yeah, of this. They my point in my comment is that this is the cultural norm. When I tag Team Boobreeds, is that that rink, that is the norm that happens there because you could tell if someone is training and they're posting a video of that on Instagram, that is, um, and the person in the background was not a Terry and we never said that it was a Terry. It is someone within right. that camp. And if yeah. even, or someone within that rink, the pro the thing is the fact that that's so normal that you would post something when someone's kind of getting dragged and arguably abused in the background that you would post that without thinking means you're pretty immune to it. So right. anyway, I came from Perm to train with Anna Sareva. I came to her at the age of 11 with double jumps. That's not that impressive. Uh, despite the fact that now everyone jumps all triples, including Axel at this age. Um, that's an exaggeration. People aren't really jump, jumping triple axel at 11, but whatever. I've been training with her for two years, learned everything, and then moved to a Terry. Anna Sareva reacted calmly to this with understanding. All right. But you couldn't just come to the rink and say, take me to the group. And she says, a Terry knew me, saw me at competitions, 
When we asked, she said, yes, I know her. There is something to work on, but I dig her. She set a deadline for three months. If there is a result, I'm staying and we continue to work. So this is the first mind game you can see that Terry is playing. She's showing indifference, which is like a big coaching tactic, especially with the Russians. They like to act like... Right. Bella Caroli would do this all the time, too. When he would accept new students in, um, when this is when he was a personal coach, they would he would have different groups of elites, basically just like a Terry, and he would have groups of six typically, and he would usually make you work with one of his assistant coaches who would train the juniors and the lower rank seniors, and if he saw something in you, then he would move you up into his group. But even if you thought you were coming to, like, train next to Kim Zemeskel, usually you were not in that group immediately, and the parents would freak out, and then I think they would use the parental freak out and the girls you know, feeling of being less than to work harder, see what they could achieve, see what their character was, and then they would either move them up into or not. Um, I also interviewed, I interviewed Amanda Urich, who is an obscure reference, perhaps, um, but she was in the 1989 um, Junior Nationals from Bella's group, and she was actually one of the original rivals to Kim Zemesco when they were coming up the ranks. And they trained together, and she said that she thought that the girls were as intense with each other and the mothers, and that whole culture was that Bella was, like, to her, like, his nastiness or toughness was completely secondary. Like, she thought the environment was already so intense that that, if... She said that when she got injured and she hurt her back, that she was doing less numbers. The other mothers already wanted to kick her out of the group and replace her or or complain that their daughter was being pushed too hard of this. Like, they were already ready to push her to the wolves. And she said what did her in was training with the back injury for six months to a year because eventually her back gave out and they had to pull her off the floor on a stretcher. And that was the end of her career. But just, like, interesting factoids about what this kind of culture does lead to. And it is interesting with the Corollis, we do see that he produced so many Olympians and things like that. There were also dozens of girls who didn't make it. And that's what it sounds like this one is. And it doesn't make their experience not valid. It's actually just contextual that I think people are willing to join this group because they see the end result. But there's a lot of other variables there. So... So they said something like probation, and she said um, in three months she learned all of the triple-triple combinations and started to learn them with the arms over the head, which was just coming into fashion. And then she said, well, let's go to the training camp. Um, and they said, did you even understand what is the secret of Tudoritza, a whole day at the rink? She says, yes. Even when I came to America, all the coaches came to me, write notes. How did she do it? How did you jump so much? But I couldn't tell everything. Well, how? Day after day. From morning, I love Russian storytelling. From my, from morning to even, you do the same thing. There is no such thing as tired, I can't. If you are tired or you are injured, you still go on the ice and work. Even if you have two toes broken, you just go and do the same thing a hundred times a day, two hundredth if necessary. I believe that, that they do that. Michelle Kwan was off the ice with her broken toe. Remember, we, we saw the cast and everything. You're being very silent. I'm like wondering your reactions. This is like... no. I'm just I'm just trying to take it all in because I'm trying to like think about it comparatively to singing and the training of singers. But of course, the the major difference here is the age gap. So and that's I'm would... trying to think because there is this kind of basically middle school high school teacher equation to this. There's a high performance and art aspect to it. So it's, it's very tricky. I think you'd almost have to, like, think of a singer's career, which lasts longer, right? But how many singers stop singing in their 30s to 40s? And maybe it's not even opera singers. Like, how about a pop singer? When they start to develop nodules, yet keep singing anyway. No oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Now, yeah. nowadays, they have shelf life and auto-tune, and you can, like, have the backup singers and dancers. But at a certain point you do look like a joke, like Madonna. So I'm wondering... like, Well, what... because in opera, for sure, if you if you were on tired chords, if you're on mm -hmm. sick chords, you're considered an idiot mm -hmm. to sing in that situation because it will harm you bigger in the picture. Mm -hmm. Or in, in the bigger picture, rather. So it it's sort of like this... 
penny smart dollar stupid approach because yes, you can muscle through something right now, but the ramifications of it are so great later. And of course, that's what is happening here, but it just seems a little bit different. In this camp, it's in, in these kind of situations where it's, it's the Crowley method, like training with injuries almost becomes a badge of honor. Well, that's the thing about, we were talking about like Vincent and Nathan, you know, yeah. because as they struggled with injuries and there was such this hysteria over, look at what's happening with injuries when Nathan injured himself uh, in the exhibition, just as we were beginning to have that quad conversation in the U.S. with the men. It's just hard to know which kind of injuries one can rebound from and should continue to work through. And when you're like, oh my gosh, stop. And when, because not every situation is black and white, right? Like you can what? get injured in the summer and perhaps back off. Or maybe if you're in the season, you get injured, you don't have the luxury of backing off, but maybe you can reduce the numbers. Although it doesn't sound like we ever hear that from this camp as much. Um, but it it's interesting, the fact that, you know, they're in the, in the muscle memory training. They want all those numbers. And when you see the girls, there is a real robotic quality to their skating. They all look the same. The footwork is all very similar. No one is developing really brilliant skating skills. No one has really terrible skating. It's very dime a dozen-ish. But, but would right? you say, like, in, in what we're talking about with coaches, you know, coaching changes and all this sort of stuff, the idea that you should see complete results in three months, to me, is not just like, so what wow, they're learning really here. hard it's they're, they're just masking something and learning tricks not to me right they're not the learning technique. sustaining skills but i don't even know if that matters do the are the parents looking for a long career i mean they want a better life they want the medals and everything else they're not even thinking that far ahead right like they're at the abby lee get me to the top of the pyramid point right and a right. terry is the top of the pyramid and then you want to climb the pyramid in a terry's group so I, I don't think that they're even thinking long-term and they're not even thinking like, well, I'm not the best girl in Terry's group. Why don't I switch to pairs? Because I could see that starting to happen. As that was my reaction reading to this. is like, why is this girl wasting her time to go to Israel to do singles when she's going to be 25th, maybe, in right. a short program at Europeans or 14th or whatever. But like, she could become a pair skater and probably the skills she learned, she could develop into a good pair skater in time, or at least have a shot. Yeah. How the Atari technique translate over? That's another question, but at least... Well, geez, I would think that in a throw jump, they could do quince in no time. <laughs> they may be able to, right? Yeah. So, but I think in the first three months, they're really learning the back spin, which is the success to all of Atari's jumps because they all tend to look the same. And I'm not just talking about the, the assist on the ice, right. which is a valid point to make, but I'm, the key to they have is on from toe through lots, they have a clear backspin position that is where they are. So she said, with broken toes, she said, when I came to the group, I had an injury. I didn't know which one and I didn't tell anyone. It was very painful for me. I could not even wear a sneaker. My, my toes were blue. She can't wear a sneaker. How are you skating? And then what are you doing when you get off the ice? Anyway, this is Russian storytelling. But yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't dispute that she was injured. Um, but I still jumped and it healed itself. So you don't really heal it like properly, by the way, the right way if you keep working on something. Uh, in a Terry Tupuris' group, they say about injuries when it's something serious, but such minor ones, well, they just train with them. Although in America, you would have been taken to the hospital and got a month of rest. So I do think, though, that if you did have broken toes, you probably would have time off in the U.S., depending on when it was. Well, but that, that's legal matters also because, you know, any parent could sue any rink at any point. Mm -hmm. There's also you informed know. consent, too, right? right? Like the parents have to. That's the other thing with when the people are upset with the Carolis. That's, and I've heard like there's speculation that certain people are in lawsuits with USAG now about when they competed on things with back injuries and you think well weren't your parents apart it gets confusing right because there there are times when the parents aren't there right like if you're at the month before the worlds and then why aren't the parents a part of this decision making of course if larry nasser is the doctor who's making the smart decisions anyway but it right. just goes 
But what are those contracts and what do they right. look like? Have, have they signed off that consent that yes. anything regarding that is handled by them? And yeah, I would yeah. think it's a nightmare. So but it is, seems like in general, those Russian skating parents are pretty much non-existent though, right? Like I can't I don't imagine. No, I mean, they said that Medvedeva's drink. mother is pretty involved. This was my impression I got. At least in Canada, she has been. And it seems like she maybe they don't come in the rink in a Terry's, but it seems like they're not wallflowers, right? Like, it, um, I don't know. That's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting point. I don't think that they... In general, they just don't seem to be a part of the framework. Of course, right. we know in the Soviet system, they weren't allowed to travel, really. Yeah. But I felt like we didn't really meet many of those parents. Right. Whereas we do know about so many others. Yeah. So this is where they talk about weight. And this is super interesting. Okay, so they said, are there strict requirements for weight? How do you keep it? Special diet. Now, we have heard several times that, remember, Zagitova wasn't drinking water at Worlds, um, and you can kind of see her even look visibly different by the end of the championships. And this is kind of considered old bullshit science by many sports science experts in the U.S. for things like cycling and other things, where they say that that would cause your muscles to cramp and actually perform lower. But there are some people in skating who think that any weight is going to hurt your rotation speed. But this is something where, like, Moskvina doesn't allow her students to drink water. Like, they want you dry, right? That we hear this. He said he grabs, like, a glass of water. Okay. Right. <laughs> we do hear this a lot, right? I'm someone, I sweat a lot, I need my water. Although, I don't remember drinking that much on the ice once I started. But anyway, I'm certainly hydrating in between. Well, especially with all these skaters and, and the traveling and the time zone changes and the different sleeping arrangements, I so, just don't understand how they wouldn't be able to hydrate. So that's okay. one of the things where in elite gymnastics, it's very different than um, NCAA gymnastics. Like they have sports science people that are hired from the university, which is a multi-million, million, you know, enterprise, sometimes way more money than USAG even has that you would think. And one of the things is KJ Kindler, who's the coach of Oklahoma, and they're always near the top. She is so big on water that when her athletes travel on the airplane, she makes them drink at least um, 33 ounces of water. That's Prefer a thing. That's preferably help. more yeah. because she wants you to avoid dehydration, to have your muscles be at optimal performance at any point. So this kind of thing that we're hearing is worrisome and I think sometimes people don't understand why or they think that we're ignorant and it's a completely different philosophy so she said they weigh you every she says wait they weigh every day um you have to write to miss it uh, just like training she says at exactly the same time except for your day off you, so they get one day off um your weight can deviate a maximum of 200 grams now that is 0.44 pounds um, and she said, and so throughout the year to have stable jumps. All this together gives the result. If I hadn't monitored, I would have hardly noticed that. Even extra 100 grams can affect the rotation. So that's a quarter pound. Um, no one. And nowhere, I'm like a quarter pounder. Oh my God. Okay, yeah, she says, no. no one nowhere pays such attention, even to your appearance, to clothes, makeup. For many coaches, the only important thing is that you work on the ice, no matter what you what you do to her. So she's saying that a Terry even wants you to dress a certain, you know, to look presentable. Now that's, that's a real thing. You know, like how people yeah. feel that's like school uniforms, not school uniforms. They want you to look, but she says not everyone can keep the bar for two or three years. Probably that's why people leave. Now the thing that concerns me. So obviously rotation speed to, there are certain things of like a target weight when you're skating. And at this level, the problem with, I think, the Atari training method for many is that they're not really learning to jump from their legs. So that spinny technique that they're learning is really develop is really developed. Which we will talk about a little bit later when we reference that Rika article where yes. she was talking about getting the quads. So therefore, she not only needs to focus on her core, but she's got to really get working on her legs. Right. And to me, it was just like further proof that she's doing this the right way. Versus now, this unsustainable way that's only dependent on the exact equations being just right with your body. Which is what we have talked about with them in puberty and everything for so long. Right. Now, I don't think that Mia Hamada is an easy coach by any respect. And I think that weight probably is. But the 
200 grams to the 100 grams. The problem that I have with this is that many sports, they have target weights. Now, Kurt says that when he was in this article that came out this week, that when he was winning world titles, he was between 144 to 147, and now he is 148.5. So skaters are very fixated on their weights. However, if you have a range, right? So say you're going to be, Kurt Browning, you want 145.5 to be your target weight. If you can plus or minus two pounds, maybe three pounds if the off season, that at least is something where you can have a relationship with food where you are going to say, okay, I can be healthy. If you notice that your weight is getting towards the 147, you, you know, two pounds up, you could say, okay, what can I change in my diet to get lower, right? And if it's you're going to cut out dairy or you're going to see a nutritionist and you're going to do these things because in reality... Your body is your instrument. You have to keep it at a certain weight, and I'm never going to dispute that. But if you're talking about 0. 0.44 pounds, the pro when you're growing and at this age of development, I think you're going to F someone up for life. I really believe that that level of fixation on weight. That micromanagement of that kind of number. I mean, because yes. we had, what, what was the scenario with Linda when she came back from thanksgiving with frank it was like two pounds right like it was yeah it was it was enough of a of a difference that at that height she's mm -hmm. she was like yes it really did make a difference but with these girls i'm sorry you're talking about less than a quarter of a pound <laughs> right so that's the difference so like the difference between, and how you talk about it i think is also really important and i think that that's really difficult you're in a stressful situation it's really easy to say something bad and someone else is going to take it the way that you don't mean it. But when you're weighing someone every day, I truly don't believe that you need to weigh some. What is the benefit of weighing someone once a week, twice a week, versus every single day? To that, that is about fear, that is about control. It's about all of these things that I think it becomes, it really think it, I think it messes a lot of these people up. I mean, think about how many girls have had issues. Well, it's another shaming opportunity there. And maybe yeah. I'm just Hector Projector about, again, like certain training I have received in the past, but it's just sort of, I just don't understand how that's a motivator that creates more of a, a tense, anxious. It does. And it creates It, it doesn't problems. strike me the confidence of the champion that like, I don't know how Medvedeva and Zagidova were able to come out of there or Kostanaya and be so open and confident yeah. knowing that they'd been so analyzed and picked apart. Because I remember talking to Jenny even about like when her weight became a problem and it was like, and did it really help you that much? Right? Like you had more strength before and you could have developed that or worked on things and maybe if you adjust your diet, but when you become in this controlled environment, I think it also burns people out. It leads to undue stress. And at the same point, the second your relationship with food goes, it becomes a problem for your whole career. Then you have injuries and stress fractures that are even related to the nutrition. So a lot of this stuff interplays with the kind of injuries that they're getting with the overtraining. I mean, at a certain point, is it going to help you to do that extra quad lutz that many more times if you're doing it tired, malnourished, not like there's a fine line and there's no exact number, right? But what is too few? What is just right? What is too many? Obviously, you're, the more strict requirements are going to want to do more, right, to get that muscle memory, to get the confidence. But if you're doing too much, you're breaking down the body. So this seems like we are running to that end. And I don't believe, and there are people that think, oh, this is Darwinian. This is just great. And I think that there's a point where you want competition and you want a strict atmosphere, but this is too much. Um, so they, she said she's a very strict coach. She was fine with how I progressed. Um, but then at the training camp in Novogorsk, I got another injury. My heel ached. I still skated. Um, she said she cannot get out of the rink to put on ice. Every day it was harder to talk with a Terry. It seems she wasn't interested in working with me. I recovered and came, but she sent me to the younger group with the words, we'll see, decide for yourself where you will go. But in principle, you can quit. I actually did half a year to get her attention. Of course, I gave up. Um, the younger group wasn't for small kids, but for those who were just not interesting for her, including senior skaters. For me, it was a disaster. She would miss the trainings of this group. After perfect run-throughs, she could say something like, well, in principle, you can still skate. 
And then when I failed something, it was the end. Um, and then they said, did she pressure psychologically? She said, not actually pressure. She said real things, but in such a way that you were in a stupor and didn't want to do anything. So I believe that they likely learned this technique in the school of sport that we hear the coaches go to because Bella Caroli did this with Kim Zemesco all the time and he talked about it openly. That when Kim wouldn't perform well, he would just ignore her. He would turn his back to her when she was doing turns. And it is a motivator, but it's kind of... For a, some, yeah. I think only for a particular type, but okay. It's, for, it's like military to like break you down to... But, but there are... Reper, I mean, look at the suicide rates on, on veterans. But I, I just think that, again, you're talking about a lot of young, young kids going through something that they may not understand. And maybe it gets results, but in the right way. I mean, is this, is this why you have someone like Luba Lusheshkina who can do the jumps in practice and then can't in competition? And then you have all these. Because they inherently believe they are bad and failures yeah. and to start unless they prove otherwise. I mean, it's such a, it's such a difficult thing because I love what Sandra had said. And I actually use it when I talk about teaching now, um, when she was talking about creating a safe, environment where yeah. one could feel vulnerable and take risks. Mm -hmm. And and that, of course, is the opposite of what you're describing. And it's a wonder to me that that some some of the girls have still been able to transcend that kind of environment and express joy through skating yeah. instead of skating to survive or skating to validate or skating for self-worth. I don't it's such a it's such a toxic way to approach the training of anything from my perspective. It's, to me, I think of it like a real singer versus Ariana Grande, right? Like Ariana Grande is interesting in the moment, short shelf life, but then you have like a real singer, you know, who continues to evolve and grow and have opportunity. And is creating yeah. art and becoming an important artist and doing all these sorts of like things instead of still, turning out tricks. People still yeah. want to see Carolina Costner skate, right? Like there's still right. inherent value if she's doing a triple toe, a double axle or her full set of triples. So t there's a big difference. And who's gained more from their career at the, at, at the end of the day? Right. I think that that's the other thing. Also, I do think that this works for many of the top kids and maybe it works for them when they're 13, 14, and then not so much as they start to develop puberty. Like people are very impressed with Trusova now, but what about if she goes through puberty and then her weight starts to become an issue and she's not landing the quad lots as consistently what kind of problems can develop psychologically? Because again, I just am unsure of the ability to alter the information being given. Yes. You know, even when, and I'm just saying this because it's someone that came up, this is not a Brian Orser versus a Terry conversation, but when he was talking about having to train Javi differently than he trains Hanyu, mm -hmm. that he's catering to what's in front of him. And I feel this is a system you can jump on and be a cog in this machine, or you cannot. So if something happens with Trusova's frame or anything were to change, I don't know that this sounds like um, a camp that will think outside of the box to come up with unique solutions to help her specifically. They'll be like, but you're not working in our machine, goodbye. Who's next? Who else can try our method and just work? I, I don't know. It makes me nervous because there seems to be a lack of flexibility in it. Yeah. I mean, and there seems like a real punishment, a lot of fear. It's a lot of negative motivation. Yeah. And I don't, I think, well, we can talk about the motivation aspect next. Um, so she said, next she said that she went to participate in a competition, but that a Terry withdrew her from the competition. Um, that she said that there was a situ situation that was announced to her and another athlete before competition. Now you will have a run through and I will decide whether you go or not. That doesn't sound so unusual because you're training to see if you were ready. But she said, I did everything. And a Terry said, no, like, what is the reason for you to go to take last place just for her? Even the fifth place is last place. Either you are among the leaders or you are nowhere. And that was the pull quote that became the headline. But still, you could go to Russian nationals. And she said, I, if I had competed, but I hadn't qualified, I skipped competitions. Of course, I trained myself, but I missed three months. I then realized that I don't want to do like this any longer. It was, necess it was necessary to decide either to leave or to return to the rink to catch up. She called a Terry and she said, go to the rink, recover, start jumping. 
it's always jump, jump, jump. <laughs> right, exactly. She said, um, I came because she allowed me. She watched from the board and said, I think you need to finish. At that moment, I couldn't understand her at all. And the interviewer said, did you fail some jump? What, what had happened? Uh, and she said, I just went to the ice and started warming up. She sat behind the boards, then called me and said, you see what children we have, what they can jump, how they can do everything. You can go to the training camp, but you need it. Something like, you can be in a group, but that's all. No chance for growth. And I quit it. I didn't see any sense to continue. I wanted to train only with her, saw her only as a coach. So this is very consistent with what we heard she allegedly said to Medvedeva, where she told her to go have babies. Because if you're hearing that she's telling this girl, you're done, you have no chance for growth, that's pretty consistent with the kind of feedback and information she's giving people in kind of a blunt when they way. plateaued with their information. Right, because think about if you're think if someone's at the end of their career, how delicate of a situation that is to have that moment uh, of that realistic conversation. And how many coaches don't have it, so they can just keep getting their paycheck. Um, right. They then went to Kucheryatsev and to tell him I was going to quit, but he was the initiator. They moved to Moscow at the age of 11. He, he saw my talent and he said, if you respect me, then she should continue. Um, so she said that she... Um, she said, I didn't understand what she meant. There was no clear line. She constantly said to me that it was necessary to quit. And then after good training, she didn't say anything, perhaps to make me angry. She acts like this and other coaches too. But it didn't work for me. I, I take it all straight. Of course, I regretted from, from some time that maybe I perceived something in my own way incorrectly. But now I'm glad everything turned out so that I didn't stay. Everything for the best. So this kind of negative motivation, I just don't think that it's necessary. I think that, look, you're dealing with teenagers. People aren't always going to train well. There are times you do need to talk to people about their diet, about their training habits, about all sorts. But of I don't think any of these particular girls, like I know we have heard from American coaches or certain Western European coaches where they're like, oh, if I could just get her motivated or oh, right. if I could just get him to the rink. But with these Atiri students or, or some of these other students, I don't see them needing to be motivated that way. They're right. Like, think about so when you were are. applying to colleges, right? I was in advanced classes. I'm sure you were. I didn't need someone to motivate me. I was intrinsically competitive. The people who make it to the Olympics are going to have that extra, right. it, unless they are just from a machine and pushed to be a robot. However, those are usually not the ones who do the best in competition. The ones who do really well have that motivation to go out there and do extraordinarily well and they knew, need to be in a disciplined environment but I don't think that this is really helping necessarily no um, I because again I think it's motivating a thing that doesn't need motivation because think about it between Kostranaya, Sherbakova and Trusova how many of them are realistically going to make the Olympics maybe right. one maybe two maybe. I, I doubt all three right I don't think I don't think right. that that's I don't think that's mean to say right um maybe one, you have to think about how many become collateral damage that didn't need to be. And maybe it's because they got burned out or they develop an eating disorder or they develop injuries that they didn't allow to heal that then they can't come back from. Or they grow. Yeah. Yeah. So she does talk a little bit about Medvedeva um, and Surskaya um, as well as and Zagitova. She said that she and Surskaya left the group around uh, the same time. Okay, so she said, at the Olympic season, I was no longer in the main group. I didn't see. She said, but Zinya had an injury then, and Alina became the leader. She said, probably this has also affected um, the relationship between Evgenia and Terry. She said, although honestly, I thought that sooner or later she would leave. Anyway, this moment comes. You can't skate in the Terry to breeds a group forever. She said that she and Serskaya left around the same time. Um, she said that she didn't see her having any problems with the Terry. She said, I know some internal things, but those are just working moments. She said, at the ring, there were no scandals or public quarrels in front of everyone. Just one moment you stop seeing this person in the locker room. Yesterday he skated, today he is not. And then you find out that Polina left the group. And it was the same with everyone. Sergei, um, Voronov, Pitkeyev, um, etc. And she said that, um, how do you think, why can't you know, Terry bring men to the top level? And she says, it seems to me that she's too tough for men skating. This only is my opinion, but when guys need to be given a break sometimes, it is difficult to train quadruples every day. And when uh, there are a lot of little girls who do dozens of quad attempts in a row just in front of you, it, it, uh, it applies pressure. Uh, maybe boys even feel ashamed. 
So I'm sure, you know, we hear that Nathan doesn't actually do the quad lutz and quad flip every day because his body can't handle it. And at his level, you know, you kind of manage and push yourself and try to peak. And it doesn't seem like that's going on. It seems like they're taking advantage of young prepubescent bodies, trying to work them incredibly hard to get the result. And then... But I was even thinking about Nathan now, and Nathan didn't really grow up in that cutthroat environment where he was neck and neck with someone in his rink, quad for quad, pushing. I mean, he was able to self-motivate. Self-motivate. I mean, I'm sure he had pushy parents. Raphael doesn't seem like uh, an easy person either. It just seems like this is why you see so many problems. I think it's just something... To watch. It's going to be interesting because I don't know if you saw, but Kanishiva, who is the one we watched her in the Junior Grand Prix, she had kind of that like Russian um, look on, you know, in the more um, traditional garb kind of outfit. I'm losing my words, but uh, she was not one of the top juniors, but she had potential. Then she actually just moved into a Terry's group. And we see already that she had the quad, but she was not someone who was doing clean longs every day last year. So I'm really curious to see how she will do uh, under pressure. Because what do you think is going to happen to Kostanaya? She's already been injured. She didn't have the triple axle last year when the other ones had well, the quad. And, and why did we hear all of this like ru- this rumor stuff going around that she was leaving? I thought she was I leaving. I think this, because I imagine because perfect. she was injured, right? So she had just disappeared from some stuff. So people yeah. thought she had disappeared because she had left. Okay. Now, if anything was happening there, we don't know. And I don't. Not in okay. that ring can't speculate. Um, okay. But I think it's interesting that she was back just in the lick of time to skate in that show. Like, is she ready? Like, how much time did she need? What was the full diagnosis of the injury? Like, these are all things that are very unclear. Although people assume they know from looking at Instagram. We did see her just do triple sows in the show. Which to me, it looked like that is her probably easiest jump. And we did see her fail on a triple flip. So it didn't look like she had been back skating for long. I just, you always wonder, like, did they have enough time off for the injury? What is the progression? What group is she currently in on the ice? And why are we rushing back for, of all things, that weird, like, Halloween costume show? You know, like. It was the Atari show. So there's a lot of line there. I guess. I mean, she's becoming a star in Russia, too. And there's. Pressure and obligations there, I guess. But it, it was just, it seemed like a quick return for that show. So Right. But I'm, she's the one that next season, I think, the judges will help the most. I think the judges will try to put Trusova um, and Shervakova behind her, it, even with the quads, if they can. I think it's, it's going to be a moment of reckoning. We haven't seen... You know, Yulia, when she first came up, did not get the Atari marks to begin with, right? And we, right. she had to work those, and she got them through consistency time and time again. I do think this season, um, if anyone who did well last year, if they keep doing well, they're going to get the marks. That's just, it's going to happen. But I think Rika Kihira, if she can do the quad and the triple axles and skate well has the best shot of remaining but that, the leader. that's a big if. That is a big if. And she may not yeah. need both triple axles and a quad at all of the events, but maybe Grand Prix Final and Worlds, maybe, I think, is when she'll need to peak. But I think that that's a real conversation. But I think that the, right. I think the difference in skating quality is the one thing that hasn't really been evaluated fairly um, right. or accurately. And if it does, Trusova, Sherbakova, I think they will start to struggle, perhaps. But we don't know. But then if you're having lower skating quality, but you're landing quads, it doesn't really matter. And then the judges get so taken with you anyway, as we see. Yeah, like, talk to me. Like, when we saw Zagitova again at that Junior Grand Prix final, and we kind of knew that inevitably she might win the Olympics the next year, um, how did you compare her skating there compared to Trusova and Sherbakova now? I know you're a big fan of Sherbakova musically. Do you find do you find that they looked? I felt she, that she looked as senior or as junior as Alina did, or do you think there was a difference between the two? The one difference that I will have that Alina always has over these two girls is, I believe her. I don't remember exactly the year when she came to a Terry's group and the whole timeline, 
But the one thing is she's always she always had more spring in her jumps at that age than these two exhibit now. These two seem to rely more on rotation. Right. Um, because it, I was impressed, Alina, when, when I saw her live in France that year, she really did have presence and the jumps weren't just tight, icky ones. They did have real pop to them. And she struggles now and has had more struggles. I mean, obviously she's just won Worlds. Um, but it was not the cleanest year. I, I, and we'll see what happens with that. Now, there's some discussion about uh, Sherbakova's music. It's about, uh, it's from the Perfume soundtrack. N not a movie that I saw, but the, the, um, the poster does say Perfume, the story of a murderer. Uh, so again, I think we're having some sort of like female, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, how does one femme fatale kind of situation offense. going on? Yeah. Um, she said, um, it's, it's a, so someone tweeted that, oh, Fran tweeted, she's always on top of it. Is Anna Shervakova seriously skating to perfume? That film is wildly inappropriate for 15 year old girl. A morbid story that ends with an orgy and cannibalism. Well, <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to have kind of a like romantic vibe that may be slightly. They're trying to mature her for the senior. Cannibalism will. So do I, that. I don't think it's going to be. I certainly don't think it's going to be a literal interpretation. I'm thinking of it as like a darker scent of a woman that they'll probably go for. With some okay. Danny, you were saying that it sounded very Danny G in the accents to you. Well, we, uh, when we were playing it, it was very space AG and then, blah, 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 yeah, and we both were kind of riffing on our Danny G choreography. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's right. It does seem to have a real, like, it seems like Shervakova is his favorite or his pet project. So I. His views, yeah. Along with Zagitova, but I think that's because she was the leader of the group. So you always want to be on his... <laughs> and he did choreograph both of her Olympic programs. And he didn't for Medvedeva. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's what we're going to see Yeah, there. we'll see exactly what we expected to see. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was interesting. Um, Alexa and Chris did a show. We did hear <laughs> that Alexa and Chris are working on stroking with Gordieva once a week. So... Fine. I would prefer twice a week, but again, even seeing them in the show, I don't get why they're not on Stars on Ice. I have to say that I... It does seem very unusual, and I know there may not be right name recognition, but they have that Olympic bronze medal just like other people do, and I think pairs is just an exciting discipline. They also And have, they have exciting pairs elements. They, they have, have a lot of diehards, too, from the Midwest, yeah. in, the, in the Stars on Ice, like, Mecca, But they right? have beautiful lifts. They have beautiful twists. These are the kinds of feats that would go over so well in a show. I would get bored seeing the same ice dancers, like, seeing ice dance that many times in a show. Even and that many teams, yeah. Like, what are the, other than, like, if you knew the Shibutanis and you have that reverence, it's exciting. But seeing them do Coldplay and seeing Meryl and seeing... Hubble and Donahue, not that they're not great, but I do want to see some real throws. Tricks. Yeah, tricks. And I think that that's something missing. Something explosive, yeah. And let's be real. If they don't have the same credentials, you don't have to pay them the same. Right. Um, but I, I was thinking about it because we saw that there was the reunion for Tom Collins, who's 88, um, in Minneapolis, and they brought all these skaters there. And he didn't have to have Mark Mitchell on the tour, but it seems like he felt more of a duty to kind of develop skating. And he would always give skaters guest opportunities. Now there, yeah. Gogolev gets an opportunity in Canada. I'm just covering my bases. Uh, Alyssa Liu, the champion, gets a opportunity as well to do a couple shows. But it doesn't seem like they're cultivating skating, taking the novice lady and putting her out there the way Tom Collins would or the junior champion and things like that. We did hear Deanna, Jenny, so many, such a, you know, talk about as they were coming up the ranks. And I just think that with skaters like Alexa and Chris, it's going to help them get more confidence so that they perform better and then get more used to performing under pressure for an audience, improve their components. 
And like, look at how much we've seen Nathan grow in a short amount of time in his. Right. When he first. Won well, the- that's the thing. The shows give them a lot more than just the money. I mean, yeah. Alexa and Chris have performed, you know, forever, so they kind of do have that experience. But, but they would get so much more regular right. performance in that brief amount of time. You do grow from it. And it, I would think it helps with nerves. Yeah. To, to just kind of normalize all of those kinds of... Think about how much you could use that twist. You don't have to pay them as much because they don't have the same medals or credentials. But they still are Olympic medalists, even as much as people joke. And at one point, they let Marissa and Simon on. So is it because they're not IMG that they're not on, that they're not on the tour? It just seems a little... It's a glaring omission. It's a glaring omission, and it's disappointing for IMG. And just... IMG always has a little bit of a slick vibe to it. And though they do do produce the tour, it just seemed like it's gotten lazier and lazier over the years. And this seems... Yeah, it's very much an afterthought. For and sure. if they're the Why only... Why I would never attend it. If they're the only... If they're the only tour out there, I do feel that they kind of do have a social responsibility to promote the sport. It just feels like everyone in skating, even in the US, is constantly trying to get the last couple of dollars out of the sport instead of pushing it forward. And I think that's what's disappointing. Like even this jump on a camp that the U S figure skating had this weekend, they brought in Conrad Orzel and Karen Chen to work with coaches and to show kids how to jump and improve their jump technique. But the thing with that is that these money makers that happen for a couple of days, maybe they're inspiring and hopefully a kid learns something that they take back to the rink. But think about how effective that is. Probably not much, right? Like, efficacy of that is probably low. And But we think about, like, our juniors, our intermediates, our up-and-coming skaters are maybe not on track with Japan or Russia. And, like, what do you do for that? Well, and again, why would you want to go to Karen Chen for jump advice and not the technicians that even worked with Karen Chen, assuming that... She was your technical icon. But mm-hmm. I mean, what that's just, and again, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just relating this from singing. It's like so many times they'll say, you should work with this famous singer, but that famous singer doesn't know how they did it. Their art mm-hmm. is not in telling others how to do it and analyze and diagnose and coach. And all of these kinds of seminar things, it gives you the idea, it's all for appearances and to just raise a couple of funds and maybe some press or something because I just think in a one-time masterclass seminary situation what can the takeaway be right because I saw I've seen Brian Orser's and Doug Hawes uh seminar and I was actually really impressed with what they were able to do they were giving you basic jump theory techniques that they were doing but it still I thought was valuable and made sense for other people, it's just being on the ice with their idol. You hope for inspiration. But the Misha, Guy, and Gracie one that I stopped by, Misha was literally on the on the microphone playing the most generic skating war horses and telling them to improvise at that point in time that I was there. And Gracie was just kind of standing back, not doing particular much. Misha was leading that. And it just felt like such a waste of time and money. And what is the point of that? I mean, they, they were not giving people one-on-one feedback about what they were doing. It was just like a bunch of girls on the ice. Yeah, and, that, to... and that's when you wonder, you have to wonder if it's just about the name affiliation. Like of if course. this is just a, a splashy thing to get people there. And Gracie got an award because she has given interviews on TV about what she's gone through. I mean, clearly they were trying to get Gracie there with the money cachet. Obviously, they probably think that they're helping her by with training costage in the way they are. But it just felt like a moneymaker. Yeah, I I mean, and even, and we'll we'll talk about this when we talk about some of the... And these are young kids. They're not experienced clinicians, by the way. And I I understand that. But yeah, even stranger (laughs) that maybe... But again, if they were inspiring, that's all I suppose Mm -hmm. it really could be. But even when we talk about some of these people that may be starting to work with fancier choreographers, Mm -hmm. if you go and you get the program and you go and you leave, you've really only done like a tenth of the the work. You know, most of the work is done over all this monitoring and all of this kind of reinforcement. 
And of course, that can't be done in a seminar, so let I, alone This is what job. I would do, is that I really think that the U.S. figure skating, we did hear that the Memorial Fund still does have a lot of money. I think you need to put some of the money that you're investing in that into development, right? And what I think, if, if I were, on the Kyoko, Mitch, Justin, person in charge of developing younger skaters is what I would do. Granted, they probably try to committee F all good ideas out. But I think that if you're getting good skaters from the intermediate, juvenile, novice level, this is when you need to put them into camps that are worthwhile, right? And maybe you have them spend two weeks in California or Colorado Springs training together once, twice, three times throughout the developmental part of the season, and that you have to qualify for that based on your finish at the Nationals, right? Or by invitation because you shoot extreme potential but had the flu, but we want you here anyway, or maybe you can pay your way here or whatever. But I think that's when you need to have the people who love teaching. Someone like um, Tom Dixon who loves doing uh, components and things like uh, you know choreography and movement class. And that's when you have Katya Gordieva run the stroking class every day for two weeks. I mean, people still want to make money in skating. You have Alyssa Sisney work with you on spins. And you have, um, you know, Frank come in and things like that. I think that's when you really will get what they've tried to do with the pair camp. You have to have it repeated and for longer stretches to get the right. technique. And ha invite the coaches to come or not come. Um, and I think those things, kind of things are going to be more worthwhile because that way you're also passing down information and lineage rather than just have everything so scattered. But It does feel chaotic and unorganized. But the USFS will also have to be ballsy and who they hire to bring in and have to be more discerning with... Because I think you want to develop the coaches and the skaters at the same time. And that's what they did in the gymnastics model. And that was one of the good aspects of the gymnastics model so that you could have someone like Simone train without a top coach and still be getting good information. So rather than just ha paying for Alyssa Liu to go wherever to hope that she makes it and it's the next Michelle Kwan, because that's... Yeah, that like every five minute session with another famous person has somehow inspired her and unlocked something quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, she did spend a month in the cricket club. We do know that she's also working for Lori. So they really are trying to develop her and do the right things. It's just that kind of you need six or seven other girls to be getting this same kind of information, attention. treatment, yeah. and attention to hopefully get one medal. You know, that's what it takes. So, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing. We just need more, we need more Lori's. You do need more lorries. More, I mean, there are gifted choreographers. I think Charlie White is someone who will at least be really good in pairs of dance. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's... I think the best are still the best. I think that there are other people... Yeah, who are, but I would love to see them stationed at a rink permanently where, where the work yeah. is continual throughout the year. You yeah. know, you can tell that China forks over that money to have Lori come choreograph it and stay. Mm-hmm and really cultivate those programs. That's why they are being performed to a next level of sophistication that other programs are not. Mm -hmm. And there are other people. There's Michael Siebert, who's still around. I'm sure when Battle of Blades comes up, he probably will be working on that. Renee Roca. There are a lot of talented people. And you mm -hmm. have to find the right personality because whoever is in charge of developing camp needs to do other things than just hire Tom Z and Corey Aid to come and run this camp and Tammy. Like you really need to even try to improve them as coaches and right. get higher results. And I think that that will be the real test. So just my thoughts. You know, I mean, that's yeah. when you have Mishin come in for a week or two and bring some of his skaters and pay the top dollar. Right. And see if, because it can't just be two days, three days. You need the... Consistency. I need yeah. to follow through and you need to film the crap out of it so that you can reference it and study right. it. I mean, there, there needs to be a task force. That's what Mitch Kyoko just need to be watching these videos time and time again to really learn what is the information that he's giving. So, right. Anyway, just little thoughts there. So, little tidbits, little tidbits. morsels. We okay. did see Alyssa Liu working on quad lutz. She did do it at one competition last year, at least in the warm up. Or in the, so, it looks like it's at least getting closer it doesn't look like the rotation is quite 
there yet, but it looks like no, and it, awesome. it looks a little painful on the landing for some of them because she did the quad lutz triple toe too, I think, in one of those videos. And I mean, there is a quality to her jumps where you wonder how it's gonna pan out. Yeah, but it does look more leggy, I suppose, yes. than others we have seen. But yes, it has much work to still be done. I mean, she has a lot of work to do before she's ready for the top. Level. Right. But she and has, she, has all, she has all that time. <laughs> she has time. She's to competition. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just more stuff. We did see um, that USAG hired someone. Jonathan, they lasted four hours. I know. And there were, the wife ran a gym that had safe sport complaints and that somehow USAG either did or didn't ask about it. They claim that it was an oversight. This person said that they knew all along that they didn't know. I mean, the, the stories are so conflicting, but it is a, just a colossal but it's, mess. But it's nothing if not consistent in its hot messness. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. So other things, did you see the video of Ilyinik ice dancing? She looks pretty good, doesn't she? I thought she did. It's a, it was a brief little clip, but it was nice to see regardless. Yes. Um, oh, someone is... T sending a, a Piper and Paul talking about in the mood that she likes our, one of our fans you thought that oh you thought Piper and Paul but upstage Tessa that was where our thing yeah or, or could potentially have a a, a number that mm -hmm. was just w that the crowd would talk about too much yeah well I think you listen I always think that you maybe you come for one and then you stay for Paul Wiley so you come yeah. for Scott Hamilton, you stay for Paul Wiley. That's what brings you back year after year. So you need right. those different people. That's why I would have hired them. Um, okay. I do think Ilyinik, something's going on with her and this boyfriend. She's, she's a ballet, famous ballet dancer. She travels with him a lot. So I think that may influence whether or not she makes a comeback. But I think that they have time. I think if they keep her in shows for at least this year, I think that... Um, uh, Solovy Dmitry Soloviev can kind of convince her to come back and maybe the Russian Federation and they can kind of look where they line She's up. in the reserves, okay. <laughs> look, watching her, she still has an intangible look that if she trained seriously and could get in the rank and do it, she could beat Tiffany and Jonathan. Like that is, they still have yeah, that intangible well, quality. Just yeah, but she, she's got, it's, with Dmitry she does. Yeah. Yeah, she yeah. had these partners, Ruslan, all of them. They were not. Yeah, the anywhere. Ruslan that really missed the mark, and unfortunately, kind of left a, a sour taste in your mouth about yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like that, a comeback may seem more difficult than it really well, would be if she did it with Solovia. I think she seemed depressed as she seemed their potential go, and then it just everything snowballed. Yeah. It seemed like once that Frida program wasn't getting them the results that they were hoping, it just. Yeah, it was not going to happen. Again, it was yeah. another girl in the sport that tail spins quickly. And it, yeah. it happens like a speeding bullet. Um, yeah, but I do think that we could see her. I mean, look, that the quality of them, even in rehearsal footage, you could just... Right. Dear God. Just beautiful. She's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Are you kidding? With the politics that got Victoria and Nikita to the silver medal of exactly. worlds, I think these two could go to the Olympics. Maybe that's what will really inspire. <laughs> Honestly, I think that if they really wanted them to come back, I think you could talk them. Make it worthwhile. And then yeah. uh, I, I imagine, because look, this academy is not going to propel itself forever. They're going to be has-beens at a certain point. They're going to be 20 new Atari girls. So I think right. she could come back for prolonged... But it's interesting because Tiffany and Jonathan are interesting. They had really interesting material this year. So I am intrigued if they can, I, I'm intrigued with what they come back with for next season. I think that their consistent work will pay off in the long run. Yeah. But I also think that. So oh, she could take them, no doubt. But Raw talent, thinking, Ilyinik yeah. and Soloviev, yeah. do it. Do they have the discipline? That's a whole other story. So Exactly. Exactly. I don't know. What else have, What else has been intriguing you? I was thinking about this. So, you know that we have the Broadway uh, rhythm uh, dance, and I was like, Jonathan is going to cringe about this, and I felt like we needed a family discussion about this. Okay, okay. Because there's going to be a choice of rhythm, but it... Okay, so here is what we know. This is from the Skate Canada website. Because you can do operetta also, which means to me there's got to be a waltz option. Right, so... Um, but it is going to be 
I think something that you're gonna hate at the end of the day. It's it's going <laughs> to be you know it's musical I'm, musical. I'm, musical you're not the only person that says stuff like that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Musical, operetta, or Broadway. So what are you hoping to see and what are you hoping not to see? Really easy, like, successful pieces are going to be, like, these high, like, Viennese um, operettas. Mm-hmm. Mary Widow, Flater Mousy type stuff. That, that, yeah, no, it shouldn't be Flater Mouse because there's yeah. so much cooler stuff. But within that kind of feeling, that era, it can be glam, it can be waltzy. How um, do we feel about Madison Hubble bringing you, like, Bette Midler body. Hello, Dolly. Like, on the nose, but like... Hello. See, I have now have they announced it yet, what they're doing? They have not, but we talk about how big they are. I think they need to do See, a uh, personality. Yes. Not they Fosse. Be... Girl, you are not Fosse. I don't no, know. they need something grand. They need, yeah. like... Yeah. We need Hubble in the red dress but being like... I fear they're going to try to do something modern, like... And not even super modern, but they're going to do something angsty like Spring Awakening or something I like... Which yeah, I think it's going to be an emo choice. But Spring Awakening was supposed to be the new rent and left me feeling very disappointed at the end of the day. No, it was too subtle or something in a way. And what, not deep enough? I don't know. It was like... Uh... So, you know how... I would like to see some classic... Stuff with, like, good pieces from the musical. Like, the Bye Bye Birdie theme song makes me want to cringe, as does Telephone Hour. Mm -hmm. But I always loved one of the pieces, Jonathan. (laughs) So, you know how Chalk and Bates, like, she's really gorgeous, and he looks... She's stunning. He's attractive, but kind of has that more straight-laced, nerdy look to him. Like, they kind of don't... they're They're unexpected couple. Their energies. Right. What if they did Bye Bye Birdie, an English teacher is real. Like, she could give you Cheetah Rivera, like, yes. <laughs> you hate it, and fine, but you know what? I no, think- no, no, I think, I, I'll be intrigued, because I'm, when they say Are Broadway, you kidding? Could Broadway you not stuff. see her giving you the Shiner's dance, the Shiner's what, ballet, as they but, call it? But what is the rhythm they're supposed to be doing? It like, seems what is like the- it's a choice this year. There was an or. We're going off the IS communicate ISU communication. Because I think that, like, how would you fit by by Birdie if there was such like a well, you, a specific you, rhythm? Because I think that whatever rhythm I would do, I would use the Shriners Ballet point to it, where it goes da 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 da, da and that's where you do the steps too. Because that okay. that's a very rhythmic piece, and then you don't have to use that. Bye, bye, bird. You know, we don't want to See, have, to me, that's a low point in music. We don't want to see, like, girls being Marissa Jarrett Winokur in the, you know, like, we don't want Hairspray coming out here. A big fat girl with a big personality. Like, that. Oh, my God. It's like my nightmare. Save it for, save it for a Lloyd Eisler drag exhibition. Like, we don't need, <laughs> we don't need, like, adult former Annie's taking center ice. Right, I mean, right. We have minute. plenty of that as it is, yeah. <laughs> um, I also it, don't want to see Wicked and the first team that does it will get my eternal ire. We don't need to defy gravity. Yeah, no, 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 but there's like such great dance music in a lot of those old Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals. They have the actual ballets in them. So I don't even think that it, there was so much ballet music written in so much musical theater mm-hmm. that, uh, that I think that you could avoid just using cheesy songs. That Can we have trouble don't... in River City? Like, I don't want us to do Carousel because we think it sounds sophisticated. I want something to be... Amazing. Like No, I was like, like, King and I has such cute dance music in it. Um and we did some wait, of the Didn't Aaron and Setledge skate to that? Like But, but that what is... I'm telling you is they're they were skating to the actual songs, not the dance music. That's All really right. different. I mean, or someone's gotta do sound of music. Can we get some um I love Sound of Music, but I don't want to see it. Unless it's like 16 going on 17, I don't want to see the... No, it has to be like all the horror music from like the cathedral scene or something. I mean, that would be the Tom Dixon, like Alex yeah. Johnson program. Yeah. You know, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I would I would probably have to go... 
Just go operetta. Like, just if Christopher just... Dean were skating, I think he could have trouble in River City because he would be the star. Uh, Jane could be Madame Librarian. I think it would be a fit. Worst, worst case scenario, they're all going to do Cats and Phantom. Who's who's gonna be the team? It's gonna be like Piper and Paul or something. Memory. They're gonna break my heart that they're gonna come out with like Mr. Mistopheles. Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Yeah, the Jellicle Ball or whatever it is. There are only three hundred more performances left at the Winter Garden Theater. <laughs> That's right. Before Call they, telecharge now. Before uh, they made it even worse with Mamma Mia. But or they could do Come On Starlight Express. That was Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical written to be done on roller skates, and they're the train. That would be the pencil and, and swallow race car kind of uh, rhythm dance. What the f are the French gonna do? Are they gonna do Notre Dame de Paris? Because you could be like, oh, oh, there's so much French operetta. They'll do French operetta if, I hope. if they really go like. I don't want them to seem like they're happy, joyful people because that is not what I like the French for. No, but there's gonna be like a dark Parisian, like gypsy baroness, like kind of thing that they can do. They'll go exotic, I hope. Gypsy hooker on the street type vibe? Because I could You know up. that old tra- classic. <laughs> like, what are these people going to do? I'm definitely thinking I have low expectations for Hubble. They've just... Did you see that queen with Zach in the, in the cape? I think that they're going in the wrong direction in their skating fame. I feel like they're bonding with Ashley Wagner and like soaking up each other's bad ideas. Well, interesting you say soaking because he did like an Instagram story where he was topless and looking very good. He always does, but But he likes to show off. He knows in the same way for a while, he kept insisting on ripping off his costume to leave just like the dicky of like a um, shirt in the Olympic year. He would take off the sleeves to it. And you were like, all right, put it away. But yeah, his Instagram story was him just like sweating in a locker room and like casually looking. <laughs> what is Olivia Smart going to skate to? I'm here for that. Whatever she does, I hope it's something great. Okay. Well, I hope it's not on the nose, just like some Man of La Mancha Spanish musical situation. Cell block tango. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Please. Can she please? Can, whoever does whatever. Oh, wait, wait, wait. When you're good to mama, Hubble could do that or Olivia Smart. Okay, maybe the Queen Latifah version. All right, I'm here for. Well, you know they have they have Carmen Jones, which is like the jazz musical version of Carmen. Like that could be a cool thing to do, because it was like uh, like smoky jazz music. What is that like Carmen the hip hopera with Beyonce? Because I don't want to see that. Okay. Except this was a success, and that. That was a flopra, <laughs> in addition to a hip opera. So, but yeah, I think sky's the limit. It's going to be fascinating, and it's going to be so telling. I think the way people go. I with... really don't want to see Hamilton. I am so scarred from the room. You're going to run happens. into. You're going to run into a lot of copyright issues if people do start doing Wicked. If people do start doing some of the Disney copyright musicals, we're going to have YouTube nightmares for those rhythm dances too. Like if, I just remember being in college and those queens singing Wicked all the time and they're off time. It was horrifying, okay? You can have An all- old school, what about Aida, the Elton John version? Only? That you could do all the fake operas. Wait, <laughs> what is your favorite song from Aida? The, um, one of Aida's things, when she's already enslaved. Easy as life, because that's where I'm at. Yeah, it, it could have been that one. Oh my god, if we can do Easy as Life, are we allowed to do the Deborah Cox remix? Like, I try to forget how much I want him here. And the, the swimming pool comes down. I was at the test run of that in Chicago before it went to Broadway. And they do like these like amazing fashion shows. It was too hip for Chicago. Chicago did not Can we it. do but Rent and it. have someone, please not Mark, I would like someone either... Maybe um, Hubble and, and Zach could do the whole um, the lesbian love yeah. argument scene. That is obviously <laughs> fabulous. But my role, um, obviously, I would love to be the drugged out stripper. That is my um, dream in life. I think that I could really uh, interpret. That's it. A- that's Angel, or no? You that's no. Maureen. Or me? No, it's they all have such similar names. No, Maureen is the lesbian. This is Mimi, right? Mimi is the drug. Oh, Mimi, yes, okay, because you know it's La Boheme, yes, right? Like, yes. Oh. No, no. So I'm trying to remember who who was who. So 
Mimi is the stripper. Yes. Okay. Oh my God, imagine Michael Quadrino, who was a skater who skated um, at regionals and sectionals on the East Coast. I used to watch him because they always had stuff at Hackensack back then. I saw, and Liberty, I used to see him skate actually a lot of times per year. And he was dating Anthony Rapp. So Anthony Rapp used to be at many. Oh, skating. Anthony Rapp, who hit on me when I was 16 years old. Anthony Rapp did notice that my zipper was unzipped. I didn't know. I was like, what were you looking there for? Like, it was, I was. You know why. <laughs> he was Kevin he was Spacey, though. Oh, yeah, well, I, that's why when that came out, I was like, well, that's rich. But that's when he rich. was dating Michael Quadrino, he was like way more than a decade older. At that point, it was a little, um, it was interesting. But then, but then Michael has always played Anthony's part Mark in any of his recreations. He got really into doing Rent. So he became a complete rent -a. So I saw Anthony on Broadway do um, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown with Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, was that good? Yeah, it, I mean, it was what it was. It was cute, but it was Isn't endearing. It, is it one of those, like, I can't, I can't bring myself to spend $300 to go see Mean Girls on Broadway. Like, to me, it just feels like... No, that's not movie. for you, it's because great. you actually like Broadway. So it, yes. that's just that's just for people who never go to musicals no, to be like, Ricky well, we like the movie. loves anything. He, he'll tell me, he'll be the first one, he'll be like, no, I like Broadway trash. I like SpongeBob, I like Mean Girls, I like... SpongeBob isn't, isn't Broadway trash. That was like real high-level production, even though it's based on a kitschy theme. That was a David Zinn production. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jonathan. Okay. Yeah, that's actually ended up being strange. I'm not seeing Spider-Man unless someone could potentially die because I want to be like, I was there. I was there, okay? <laughs> but I have no interest in the actual music from spider -Man. Yeah, correct. Okay. Kimmy Schmidt, they do a whole thing about where he is auditioning for Spider-Man on Broadway and it's just basically, a, they just abuse him and see how much his body can handle. <laughs> if anyone does Gypsy, it better be Patti LuPone. You know my favorite musicals are Gypsy, Avita, okay. not okay. with Madonna, okay? No, never. I like Rent, I do. I, I, do you think people will try to do Sunset? I do like I, Sunset with Glenn Close and Patti. Hopefully Patty would be singing, uh, or Barbara. Uh, but I do, I liked Sunset. I paid a lot of money to go see uh, Wait, you know what? We'll probably get a lot of Yentl programs. Well, Papa, can you hear me? And all that I'm, kind of I'm not opposed, but... Um, yeah, actually, that wouldn't be a bad choice. I mean, it is Mother's Day. I just spent the day with Debbie. We, we, we love a Yentl. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> For being Catholic, Debbie really also loved to watch the Diary of Anne Frank movie all the time with Shelley Winters. Remember oh, Shelley Winters, who was in a Poseidon I adventure? She I was, totally remember. She played the one in the Diary of Anne Frank who didn't want to give up the mink coat. Right? I forget. Also kind of poem in a way. Yeah. Okay. Um, and next. then I'm thinking, my other music, I loved Next to Normal. I mean, there's a, oh, the French could do Next to Normal. Uh, a, a nice feel-good story about mental health. Um... <laughs> I just feel like the Oh, they know. Come on, they could do A Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah, that's the Notre Dame. <laughs> the, Dis the Disney musical. <laughs> God Help the Outcasts. Remember when Courtney Hicks skated to that? Trying not to... Okay. Yeah, I know. Try not to quote Lucille Blue. If you remember how she always used to say, why invite the comparison? Okay, continue. What about the suicide one that I saw? It's on there now, but I saw it not with the one who's in the original Broadway cast recording, but... I loved it. What was that? I saw it. The you suicide know. one. Yes, the one the one boy commits suicide, and the other boy pretend who's socially awkward pretends like they were such good friends and writing letters together. I loved it. Um, and I dear I loved, Evan Hansen. Dear Evan Hansen. Yes, there's music in there that we could use. I don't think it really fits a um, a rhythm dance, but maybe a short program for Jason Brown. That Corey would have him do that. Oh, are you kidding? She would be like, Jason, I think there's a real viral moment, and then we could talk about mental health. Yeah, exactly. And how I'm, well, okay, I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> how do you feel about him doing Schindler's List? Well, you know, actually, if I could tolerate anyone doing a Schindler's List program, it's probably him. So you um, know that when I was learning to skate, that was the first song I ever wanted to skate to, because I loved... It's beautiful. Yeah. I loved Katarina and Paul Wiley and Joshua Ferris. Right. I hope, my hope for this is that this deepens Jason and makes him soulful, with his ultra flexibility and the things we always see him do, I hope we do see some new spins for him because we do see the same spins every year. Um, 
then I think he can push himself in that area and not like lose time of the jumps. Cause I don't, do we think the quads are really coming? Like, yeah, just, just let us enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel I would love, I, I worry it'll go too much in the Yulia where we're going to be like, you know, <laughs> it's the end. A, a bit of a showy version. A bit of a showy time in Auschwitz where we're putting our leg over our head. At the right. end, like exactly. it just doesn't make a lick of sense. Right. Like right. the choreo sequence at the end. Like I, I, I mean, it's going to be hard to not have comparisons to either Yulia or Joshua Ferris. Or I mean, Joshua, they, because they came up together. I mean, you know, I, people, I, the people that were referencing Yulia, the only reason I see that is because of the flexibility. But to me, Joshua Ferris killed it with Schindler's List. Like, it was done. It was put away. <laughs> no, I don't mean it like that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> People were dying to see his Holocaust tribute program tape. Well, I was, okay? I mean... <laughs> okay. There's a video of me somewhere in the ethers, like, skating around, improvising the Schindler's List when I was first skating. I mean... Well, it's, it's exquisite music. Like, it's it totally uh, does make sense I to totally skating. find myself seriously dramatic enough to pull it off. Like, with... It's angsty. It's dark. And it needs the gravitas in order to be sincere. So yes, I think you raise an interesting point about about that authenticity of beauty and not just kind of generic, beautiful positions. Yeah, you have to really give it some soul, you know? I yeah, think... actually now having judged that 94 program, like there was something Mishki Chanaka Dimitri had brought to that free skate that was so raw and emotional and real, even if none of their positions look as beautiful as the positions Jason can make, but you kind of want Jason and Tampa. Like, they had oh. soul too. If you watch the in a totally it, different way. Yeah. Yeah. In a totally different way. Yeah. Um, also, Gogolev, we have more conf confirmation that he is with Raphael. We knew that already. Yeah. And people really tried to refute that. For they some always reason. will. And they're going to try to refute that Daleman is going. Because you know, Canadians, it's hard. They want to keep people, just like how Russians want to keep them all together. <laughs> they want to keep him in Russia. They want to. Canadians, he's all they have. They want to keep their little wonder kid. With yeah, you're a Orser. tremendous star. Let him have the. You know that they want him to reunite with Brian Orser and that Brian Orser can finally bring a Canadian to the top, but I think it's going to be Raphael. And then we can yeah. make tons of jokes that, well, in Canada, you do go to the US to become successful. Anyway, like, just like Tess and Scott did. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> don't, don't they always say that at Saturday Night Live? That was like, that's what the, the comedian said. Well, you know, you have to go to. Um, Any. <laughs> Amazing. That's really funny. Oh my god, the hate mail we we're gonna get. But anyway, I know. Listen, to the list. And skating, yeah. Americans go to Canada all the time. It's just jokes, people. We're not yeah, serious. Yeah, exactly. Christy didn't win until she went to Edmonton. Okay, like everybody relax. Everyone relax. Okay. It's jokes. It's <laughs> jokes. Okay. We gave you Jason, and we took Stephen. <laughs> You have some beauty for a while. We would like some more quads. Yes. Oh my okay. goodness. Yes. Yes. And yeah. and we keep getting more commission shows that we're doing on Patreon. We have some for a um, ninety one Trophy La Ligue, the ninety five. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Oh, I'm ready. And I think that we should judge Tanya against them because Daniel Lee loves ranking. He actually works at getting people into colleges. And of course, you know, he was all over that Lori Laughlin scandal. I mean, yeah. I mean, Daniel Lee, like, tells you anything. He'll be like, oh, that's a tier this school. Oh, that's a tier this law school. Oh, that's a tier this firm. So, you know, he's all about the, he says that he has ideas for how a Terry can make her school more competitive. Um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> he has no issue with it. She'd probably hear him out. Yeah. She would. Um, he's all about the ranking and, and okay. all about all, his whole career is that. It's, it's in that, getting people into the appropriate colleges. And, uh, so I think that we, he's also doing, he wants us to judge different people from different decades against each other. So a, a, a men's and a women's. And we were having to discuss, cause I'm like, listen, if you have Yuna against Christy Yamaguchi, people are gonna be like, of course Yuna has to win. I'm like, I don't think that that's really an appropriate one. I think then you'll have to do a different decade for that group of ladies. So. But you had talked about bringing back like our favorite things, where we would talk about like our favorite music. Oh, I still want to do that. Programs. Highlights on a more obscure skaters that were like guilty pleasures for oh. us coming up. You wrote that amazing thing about the Eastern European girls from the 90s. 
about um, Anna Recchio and Christina Zacco. And I don't and even I, remember writing it, is the funny but thing. But I just, I, I was like, yes, this guy gets me because I knew these girls and they were guilty pleasures for me too, in like a train wreck sort of way yes. on ESPN too. So I think... Um, so I wrote one about the Canadian really ladies once too and one about Roz back in the day. I love Roz though, one of my favorite guests ever. But mm. watching her as a pro really was its special kind of... Yeah. It's a pleasure. Uh, does anyone remember like, that from the Like intro? talking about Rory Flack, for instance. <laughs> Guilty pleasure. With Guilty the house. Pleasure. Like, how is her house doing after it burned down? Did, did Susan Meyer burn it down because she was trying to see Mike Delfino? What is the story there? <laughs> remember that Kurt Browning also had his house burned down because of, remember the, the leaf blower in the Porsche? That's everybody trying to be Lisa Left Eye Lopez. I know. Didn't okay. her house burn down? Or was the she going... greatest episode of, Beyond, no, the TLC episode of Behind the Music and the MC Hammers are the only two you ever need to watch. When Lisa Left Eye Lopez goes, and then I burn that shit down. I mean, that. remember she lit sneakers on fire? And in, the, in the bathtub. Yes. Yeah. We've clearly seen it more than twice, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it was an it was an iconic moment in American music history. It really was. <laughs> I miss the E True Hollywood stories before it was just the publicist putting them out. Like I miss the original ones where they would, you know, talk about Diana Ross. Or it was always like Behind e. the scenes, yeah, behind the music. And it when it was helpful. like the depressing intro music for, you know, the cast of Three's Company. On the intro, I would store it. And you'd be like, And you knew it didn't go great. Wait, or the <laughs> one of, um, uh, with Mackenzie Phillips, that show. That one was like crazy. Like crazy. Yeah. And we they usually re air that on Father's Day. I'm ready. Shit. <laughs> Jonathan, we need to go. I don't, it's not on Patreon. It's not on Patreon. I'm sorry. Yes. I if mean, you want our real opinion, go to Patreon. Also, and I talked about this on the live show, I am thinking of doing a TSL patreon discussion board so that we can but i want it to be the kind of discussion different than other boards where we can really discuss training and music choices in a way where it's not just fans being like you hate this person like i want us to right. get nitty gritty i want you to be able to talk with dave and jonathan about musicals fitting different your choices yeah <laughs> I, but I want to have like really intense discussions like you have to bring your a game for this and that is my hopes and dreams okay and i hope they all come true dave all right. Well, yeah. You know, this mind is always working. So, all right. Hold it, Edge. Look sexy. What musicals do you want people to skate to? Bye, guys. Uh. <laughs>